Actually Speaking, Episode 10, Skeptical Support Structures. Want to know how to live skeptically and still have friends? So do I. Let's figure it out. Actually Speaking, a podcast that explores the human side of skepticism, critical thinking, and the skills we need to make it through the day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 10 of Actually Speaking, a podcast that sets the science aside and explores the human side of skepticism. My name is Mike Moraz, and today we'll be discussing how to create skeptical support structures to get us through some of the more challenging periods of our skeptical lifestyle. We all experience it, burnout, stress, frustration, emotional and mental fatigue, and sometimes it brings us to the point where we just want to give up, withdraw, doubt our purpose, or in some extreme cases, lash out at others. A skeptical lifestyle, like so many other things, carries with it an enormous amount of stress in a variety of ways. No one is immune to it. Even the most prominent and vocal skeptics, whose energy seems endless, share those same moments of fatigue and doubt. And today, we're going to hear from some of them. We'll learn what they personally find to be the most challenging and draining aspects of their skeptical lifestyle. And they'll also share with us their own means of support and how they recharge their skeptical batteries. When we talk about the emotional and mental challenges and fatigue of a skeptical lifestyle, we're really talking about stress. The sources of the skeptically induced stress vary greatly, but the net impact on us is basically the same. It's not something we can eliminate. Stress is a very normal and helpful aspect of our human nature. What we want to be able to do is manage and minimize it so it doesn't negatively impact our ability to live and promote our skeptical lifestyle. How we manage stress, in a very broad sense, is actually simple. More friends equals less stress. It's our connections with friends, people we trust, that reduce our stress, recharge our skeptical batteries, and provide us support through challenging times. The variety and diversity of this concept actually comes from how we define a friend and what constitutes a connection. We're fortunate to live in a time where technology allows us to expand our concept of a friend. It's no longer limited to family, coworkers, or people you can physically meet. Friendships aren't limited by distance, and in many cases they consist of people we've never actually met in person. Similarly, the ways in which we connect with friends has also changed. We're no longer limited to coffee shops or the pub. We have options. Telephones, websites, Skype, social media, local and national organizations, conferences, just to name a few. And in some cases, that connection is even one-sided, such as right now through this podcast yet it can still serve as a connection and a source of comfort and support. We create support by meeting and connecting with others, individuals and communities. A skeptical support structure is basically a network of friends, people we trust, that we can connect with in a variety of ways to minimize the stressful impact of living a skeptical lifestyle. The more diverse your personal support network is, the more effective it can be. Support structures are different for everyone. What we'll do here today is provide you with a variety of options and examples to get you started. Keep in mind that support structure you create can assist you in managing stress in two ways. It can both assist you in preventing stress from building up, as well as help you release it when needed. Wild swings in stress levels is never good. Whenever possible, prevention is always preferable to cure. We'll mix it up a bit with ways of meeting others as well as simple stress reduction ideas. I've got 10 suggestions to help get you started. Number one, realistic expectations and good communication. The best way to keep skeptical stress from building up is to reduce the interpersonal friction that can cause it in the first place. All the skills we've learned in this podcast have been geared to doing just that. But the most important is probably formulating realistic expectations and appropriate goals. Seeking to change someone's mind is both stressful and unrealistic. Assisting people in making informed decisions is far more attainable. Make sure the goals you set out to achieve are within your control, because when they're not, it's a quick trip to burnout. Similarly, using the skills of I statements and active listening also have the benefit of making our interactions with others 
less stressful while increasing effectiveness. You may not adopt every aspect of communication we've discussed, but the more you can incorporate, the easier it'll be to manage the resulting stress. Number two, share your skepticism so others can find you. Staying in that skeptical closet presents its own unique form of stress and in many ways prevents us from building a support network. Even if you do it in small incremental steps, the more of your skepticism you can share openly with others, the more likely you are to find and identify like-minded individuals within your existing social structure, and the more likely they are to find you. Yes, it can present new challenges, but they'll likely pale in comparison to the benefits of being true to who you are with others in your life. You just might find individuals who agree with you that you weren't aware of previously, or if not in agreement, might at least care about you enough to be supportive despite any differences. Number three, connect with others through local skeptic and atheist groups. It may seem like you're the only skeptic in your area, but I guarantee you, you're not. Do a Google search for local skeptic or atheist groups in your area, and you're likely to find local communities of skeptics who've already begun to organize themselves. Meetup.com is a great resource for this. Start local, but broaden your search to surrounding areas if necessary. When you find a group, contact them and find out what meetings or events are available to attend. Then, attend and make new friends. Even if you don't continue your involvement with a group, it can at least lead to new friendships and contacts that you can pursue separately. Hey, this is Surly Amy with Skeptic. I think one of the most draining aspects of day-to-day -day skeptical life is dealing with cognitive dissonance, dealing with people that will never change their mind despite mountains of evidence. You can pile fact upon fact upon fact upon fact, and these people will not change their minds. It's also frustrating dealing with the unsinkable rubber duckies like homeopathy and ghosts and psychics. You can debunk them over and over and over again, and they're still going to pop back up. And that can, you know, really, it can be draining. It's true. But you have to remember that the people that we're really trying to reach are people that are sitting on the fence. They're people that aren't quite sure yet. And there's a lot of those people out there, and we can really reach them. And we have to remember that that's who we're here for. And where do I turn for support? Well, podcasts, blogs, books, you know, social networking. There's so many great skeptics and atheists and, and, and humanists and all kinds of fantastic people that are so accessible on the Internet. It's, it's a fantastic thing. So remember to stay connected and to keep up the good fight. Talk to you soon, guys. Number four, connect with larger skeptical organizations and communities. Usually, building support networks grows from the inside out. We begin with people in our daily lives and build outward from there. However, if you're like me and local skeptical friends are hard to find, you might need to work from the outside in. Online skeptical or atheist organizations and communities are a great place to start. Organizations like the James Randi Educational Foundation, Center for Inquiry, Australian Skeptics, or the Skeptic Society are just a few examples of some of what's available and are great entry points for connecting with national and global skeptic communities. But you'll also find communities around podcasts, authors, blogs, magazines, or even local chapters of larger organizations. There are several websites you can go to which list skeptical organizations, but one of my favorites is grassrootskeptics.org, created by K.O. Myers. Visit the site and click on their resource tab to see a comprehensive and growing list of skeptical communities, groups, and organizations. You'll find a lot of resources there. Number five, attend national or regional skeptic conferences. If websites and internet forums aren't your thing, and let's face it, they're not for everyone, Consider connecting with others by attending a conference. The two I'm most familiar with are The Amazing Meeting, also referred to as TAM. It's in Las Vegas each July. And the other is DragonCon, held in Atlanta each September. Of course, these are U.S. conferences, but their equivalents exist in many other countries. This was my starting point for connecting and making friends in the skeptic community. I went to TAM 7 and didn't know a single person. I left feeling as though I was part of a larger family. 
Spending several days meeting and talking with like-minded people wiped away tons of fatigue that had built up from years of skeptical isolation. Conferences are a great way to replenish, expand your knowledge, connect and create friendships which you can continue long after the conference ends. Amy, who you just heard a moment ago, emailed me to add her recommendation for the support and energy that conferences can provide. I couldn't agree with her more. Take some time to explore your options. There are several to choose from, and the list is growing each year. Number six, create social media support. Social media such as Twitter and Facebook is incredibly useful in terms of support, community, and connections. The ability to create your own follow list and friends list is a dream come true for many of us. It's the ultimate customizable community builder and support structure. Fill your Twitter follow list with like-minded people you respect, prominent skeptics, celebrities, or local friends and family. Whoever you want that inspires, educates, energizes, and supports you. Either directly or through others, social media can also be a way to meet new people. It's how I met Joe Rigel, a buddy of mine on Facebook who I had never met in person but has become a very real source of support for me. I got up the guts one day to post that I was an atheist in a comment thread which he noticed and responded to. We've been friends ever since. Here's what he had to say. I think as a skeptic, I get the most frustrated when I'm confronted by someone who, though they may be intelligent, well-educated, and even skeptical about many subjects, they hold some belief, whether it's alternative medicine, Atlantis, or whatever it may be, and no matter what argument or evidence I present, they shut down. They stop listening. I don't know if it's what I call Fox Mulder syndrome. They want to believe, so they do believe. Or perhaps it's intellectual hubris. They can't admit that they were convinced by a faulty argument. I don't know. When I do feel that frustration, though, I don't crack open a book by Shermer or Sagan. I don't want to get stuck in an intellectual feedback loop. Intellectual growth and knowledge don't come from listening to those whom you agree with, but from listening to different opinions. I turn to a core group of three friends. They aren't capital S skeptics by any means, but they are intelligent and open-minded. They listen to my arguments, truly listen, and I listen to them. When they ask a question and I respond, I don't know but I'll find out. They don't take it as a gotcha moment. They want to know what I discover. I may not have made them skeptics yet, but that's most likely my failure and not theirs. Number seven, connect with like-minded individuals. Not all skeptics or atheists share the same views, and you'll need to decide what like-minded means for you. In most cases, we want to open ourselves to differing viewpoints and perspectives. That skeptical echo chamber is a very real hazard we need to avoid. But when it comes to support structures, we do want to take extra care to connect with individuals who don't deviate too much from our own core goals, values, and perspectives. Obviously, this is flexible, and differences can be valuable. But just remember, if you're trying to recharge your skeptical batteries, it's better to reduce interpersonal friction even with fellow skeptics. Make sure the people that you turn to for support really are like-minded in ways that meet your own unique support needs. Number eight, periodically remind yourself why you're a skeptic. Sometimes we can lose sight of the bigger picture in the routine of daily life. I collect quotes, articles, books, and specific podcast episodes I find particularly supportive and energizing. When I begin to lose focus or energy, I turn to those resources. Sometimes the well-intentioned arguments of my non-skeptic friends starts to get to me, and I begin to ask myself, what's the harm? That's when I quite literally go to whatstheharm.com and remind myself of the bigger picture and risks. And I think all of us can agree that it's hard not to get re-energized when we look at the children in our life and realize what impact our actions will eventually have on their future. This is Desiree, and I'm the host of Skeptically Speaking. The most challenging aspect of living skeptically for me is not speaking to believers. I actually really enjoy those conversations. Um, I'm a fairly nice person who mostly just asks a lot of questions. Uh, I find that often shows people the gaps in their own logic. 
in sort of a gently guiding people to evidence-based conclusions kind of way. It's definitely not quick, but I feel like it's more effective long-term. What I have a harder time with is with some of my fellow skeptics. I do think that there's a time and a place for strong language and for arguing. Definitely. But when people are condescending or bullying or needlessly inflammatory, that really makes me uncomfortable. Um, I can't even remember the last time that yelling at me to do something actually worked. Uh, maybe, maybe when I was a kid. But that's literally because I didn't have a choice. And there's also, you know, if you tell me what I should be doing, it immediately gets my back up. And even if it's in my best interests, I won't do it on principle. Um, and people being mean to other people will always make me root for the underdog, even when the other guy's right. Um, it's possible that I have some authority issues, which is why I'm not telling people what they should or should not do. Um, just be aware that I probably won't want to talk to you if that's how you relate to people. But my method of dealing with this is actually pretty simple. Um, I go hang around with pleasant people for a while. And I pretend the entire world is like that. Suspension of disbelief is fun. Number nine. Receive support by providing support. A great way of gaining support of friends in your life is to be a source of support to others. Use those listening skills and help a fellow skeptic through a rough patch. Let people vent. Venting is just blowing off steam, talking, and letting out frustration. Sometimes we just need someone's ear and not someone coming in to fix or solve a problem. The act of supporting another person is very often therapeutic and recharges us as well. I get my greatest boost of energy by simply helping fellow skeptics, and I find that the favor is almost always returned. Number 10. Learn to step back and take a break. Living the skeptical lifestyle 24-7 can be draining. You may enjoy staying up to date with the latest blogs, articles, tweets, and details of the skeptic community, but you can burn yourself out too. Unplug from social media and the news streams from time to time. Commit to getting through a day without saving the world. Get out and do something non-skeptic related. Spend some time with friends and family and just enjoy yourself. Other skeptics have your back. Don't worry. The world won't end. Hello, this is Richard Saunders from Sydney, Australia, host of the Skeptic Zone podcast. Now, what do I find to be the most challenging and draining aspect of living skeptically in my daily life? Well, generally it's pretty good, but sometimes people will be quite offended by your point of view. It's very strange. I think the most challenging thing is trying to gently and slowly explain your point of view to other people who have got their minds made up about the evil skeptics. That can take some practice. And uh, sometimes it's hard not to uh, lose your patience. But the slow, easy approach I find is the best, but it certainly is challenging. For support, I just turn to my skeptical friends, uh, and there are plenty of those on the internet, of course. And uh, I'm very lucky that I know a lot of sceptical people right here in Sydney I can turn to for support and good times, which is also how I recharge my sceptical batteries. But the biggest recharge I get is attending things like The Amazing Meeting or Dragon Con. So this year, I think my batteries are going to be charged quite a bit. So... What do I find the most challenging and draining aspect of my skeptical lifestyle? For me, the most challenging aspect is the isolation it creates. I come from a very religious family, prone to superstition, alternative medicine, the supernatural, political extremes, and, unfortunately, anti-intellectual views. Other aspects of my life place me in very progressive environments where pseudoscience is common and openly promoted. Suffice it to say that most days, simply opening my mouth can bring on a world of hurt. But it's not being around non-skeptics that drains me. That's actually a plus, 
since the opportunities for educating others are abundant. Now, the drain comes from the isolation I feel as a result of having very few people to turn to in my daily life. Until recently, and for many years, my only skeptical support was my wife. I literally don't know how I make it through most days without her. She's a skeptic through and through, although not one who wears it on her sleeve. We talk often, but sometimes the biggest comfort is just knowing that I can be myself around her and in our home. That's a luxury for me, and it's not something that everyone has. Recently, I've been fortunate to meet two other local skeptics, Matt and Lacey, a married couple in our town who have become very good friends. I think they were feeling pretty isolated themselves and just as relieved to meet us. But in terms of my daily life, that's it. Three people is my all-time high. So as you can see, I'm at the beginning of building my own skeptical support structure. I've got a lot of ground to cover, but I also have a lot of options. How do I recharge? Well, by helping fellow skeptics. Being a source of support for other skeptics is what energizes me to meet the challenges of my own skeptical lifestyle. I'm a people person, an extrovert by nature, so the isolation of skepticism can hit me a bit harder than most. Simply connecting with others isn't always enough for me. I also need to contribute. I'm happiest when I'm helping. The ways to build skeptical support structures and manage the stress associated with a skeptical lifestyle are endless. Limited only by your own creativity and resourcefulness. But the best place to start is by looking inward, honestly, and identifying what you personally find to be the most challenging and draining. Ask yourself, what is the most challenging and draining aspect of my skeptical lifestyle? Who do I turn to for support? And how do I recharge my skeptical batteries? It's not the same for everyone, and what works for one person may not for another. Knowing your own limitations will help you identify the support strategies best suited for you. And you might find that they change over time, so be sure to revisit them. Before we wrap up, I'd like to extend my thanks to Amy, Joe, Desiree, Richard, and all of you who submitted written suggestions. Your contributions are greatly appreciated. If you have questions, comments, or would like to share your own tips and ideas on living skeptically, send them to actuallyspeaking at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash factually. Thanks for listening.